Welcome to NTD China News. I'm Karen Chang. Making headlines this Monday, January 28th. No trial for Bo Xilai today. When will it happen? Japan's former ambassador to China weighs in on the island's dispute and why China put two Tibetan men on trial. The highly anticipated trial of Bo Xilai did not happen today. Last Friday, Hong Kong-based newspaper Da Gong Bao cited a source in Beijing as saying that the former Chongqing party chief would face court in Guizhou province today. All that happened at the courthouse in Guiyang City was a convergence of reporters with Bo Xilai nowhere in sight. Monday came and went in China, and there was no trial for former communist official Bo Xilai. Dozens of journalists found that out Monday morning after converging outside a courthouse in Guiyang City of Guizhou Province. Last Friday, a Hong Kong-based newspaper reported Bo would be put on trial there today. Now, a state media report suggests the trial might not happen until at least March. The Global Times, a state-run English language paper run by People's Daily, cited an unnamed official as saying Bo would not go to court until after the two sessions. These are the annual meetings of China's rubber stamp parliament, the National People's Congress, the Communist Party's political advisory body, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. I don't think the rumor came out of thin air, and now that the trial didn't happen, I don't think it'll happen before the two sessions either. It brings up complicated issues, and the competing factions are still fighting. That's probably why the trial is delayed. The uncertainty over Bo Xilai's impending trial has fueled comments on the lack of transparency within the communist leadership, particularly over a major case like this. Chinese political scholar Liu Juning commented on his microblog Weibo account, quote, "A grand nation such as China, and we can't find a more trustworthy source than rumors." Bo Xilai's case has grabbed global attention. It exposed a deep-seated rift between the top echelons of the Communist Party. Bo has not been seen in public since last March, and state-run media has revealed little about the exact charges Bo might face. More developments in the ongoing saga of the Daoyu or Senkaku Islands. Former Japanese ambassador to China Yuichiro Niwa said today it was wrong for the Japanese government to buy the islands from their private owners last September. He said the timing was bad and was viewed by Beijing as an insult. Niwa had previously been seen by some in Japan as being too soft against China in the islands dispute. The Japanese government purchased the islands as a preemptive move to prevent a plan by hardline Tokyo Governor Shintaro Ishihara to develop the islands. But the purchase resulted in violent anti-Japanese protests in China. It impacted Japanese businesses there and prompted war rhetoric from the Chinese army. But there are signs both sides are trying to let the issue cool. The newly elected Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sent an envoy to China last week to meet with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. She indicated the dispute should be shelved for now. For his part, Niwa feels that neither side wants the dispute to escalate to an armed conflict. The Chinese military says it has successfully tested its first mostly made-in-China long-distance heavy cargo plane. State media says the freighter dubbed the Y-20 took off from an air force base near Xi'an in northwestern Shanxi province. The plane can reportedly fly over 27,000 miles with 66 tons of freight. This means it can travel more than halfway around the Earth with roughly the weight of an army tank. The Chinese army currently uses Russian IL-76 freighters. It has a much shorter range and a lighter load capacity. The Y-20 looks similar to the U.S. Air Force's C-17 cargo planes. It will use dated Russian jet engines, though, until the Chinese army develops its own. The Chinese regime spends heavily on its military. Officially, it has the world's second-largest defense budget after the United States. China says its military spending is purely defensive. Recent aggressive movement to assert territorial claims have unnerved its neighbors, though, prompting them to boost defense spending as well. Chinese officials have been at a loss as to how to stop a slew of Tibetan self-immolation protests. One deterrent they're trying is charging Tibetans with inciting the fiery demonstrations. Two men faced trial over the weekend on these charges, but it's questionable whether the hardline tactic would work. A court in Sichuan Province has tried two Tibetan men on Saturday for quote intentional homicide. The men were accused of inciting self-immolation protests last year. State-run media cited a statement by the People's Court of the Tibetan Chiang Autonomous Prefecture of Aba, 
It said 40-year-old Lorong Konchok and his 31-year-old nephew pressured eight Tibetans to self-immolate, three of which have died. The men reportedly confessed to the crimes and to following orders from the Dalai Lama. Tibetan writer and activist Sering Wosur says these accusations against the Dalai Lama are typical of the Chinese regime. Without exception, the Chinese Communist Party always pushes the responsibility onto the Dalai Lama and says everything is organized by the Dalai Lama and so on. The Communist Party never reflects on what has gone wrong in their policy on Tibet. They never consider this and instead avoid taking responsibility themselves. Tibetans are used to this, but it's a method that hurts Tibetans. The Dalai Lama has repeatedly called for an end to the wave of self-immolations. He says the acts are futile and have not changed the Chinese regime's policies towards Tibet. Chinese state media has given little attention to the protests in Tibet, but did widely cover Saturday's trial and pointed to foreign influences as behind the immolations. Wooster says she expects more cases like this one. Already this month, Chinese authorities have arrested several Tibetans and accused them of inciting self-immolations. Since 2009, almost 100 Tibetans have self-immolated to protest against what they say is oppressive rule by the Chinese regime. More than 70 of the protests were fatal. And coming up after the break, China's largest shipping company expects big losses for 2012. And it has begun. The annual Chinese New Year travel is more crowded than ever and a very lucky escape for a motorcyclist. And welcome back. China Costco Holdings is expected to post another major loss for 2012. It will be the second year in a row for the state-run shipping company. It's not a good sign for China's shipping industry, which acts as an indicator for the export-dependent economy. China's largest shipping company Costco has indicated it expects big losses for 2012, a sign that China's export market is continuing to struggle, despite reports of overall growth last year. China Costco Holdings issued the warning late last Friday. It prompted the company's share to drop by more than 5% on Monday, according to the Financial Times. Well, actually, you know, it's uh, not that surprising, maybe, um, because the growth is, uh, is a lackluster compared with uh, what the growth rate has been in the past. You know, it's actually the export is slowing down. Uh, in fact, uh, several other shipping companies from China and uh, ship, ship makers, ship builders as well, are in big trouble right now. Professor Frank Tianxie believes it will be a while yet before China's export market sees an improvement. Uh, because this uh, export you know, driven sector of Chinese economy is largely dependent on the, you know, the recovery in Euro Europe and America you know, and Japan. And we, of course, we don't see that happening. And those markets, particularly Europe, are still struggling to recover. State-run Xinhua reported on January 21st that local shippers also expect gloomy times ahead. In 2012, 80% of Chinese shipping companies were operating on a loss. That's 10% more compared to 2011. 2012 would be Costco's second year of net losses. In 2011, the state-run company posted a loss of more than 10 billion yuan, or around 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. The Financial Times reports the company expects to post a similar figure in March. Apple just released the latest report of its annual supplier and factory audits. While some things have improved, there are still nagging problems like underaged workers in China. On Saturday, Apple Inc. sacked one of its many Chinese suppliers for using underaged workers. Every year, Apple releases an annual supplier responsibility audit. In the most recent one, Apple reported it discovered in one supplier 74 instances of using workers under the age of 16. Apple is attempting to resolve the roots of this problem by tracking third-party labor agents that supply underage workers and forge documentation. Although none were found in Apple's final assembly partners, 11 facilities are or were using underage labor. According to the report, all but one did so unintentionally. There are 106 active cases and 70 from the past.
The underage workers were typically hired because labor agencies conspired with families to forge age verification documents. The factories did not have the resources to catch it and thus hired the underage workers. Despite droves of suicides at the Foxconn factory in Shenzhen due to poor working conditions and a scandal involving a toxic cleaner, Apple suppliers do face tough standards. These standards cover everything from pay to overtime to underage labor and are enforced by the Fair Labor Association. Extensive annual investigations are meant to ensure that factories and suppliers are meeting those standards. The audits cover 1.5 million workers in a total of 14 different countries. It's the biggest movement of people in the world and it's getting bigger every year. Lunar New Year is coming up on February 10th and there's no doubt the travel will be massive. China's annual 40-day spring transport season started on Saturday. This year will witness a record high 3.41 billion journeys by train, air and road. It's all due to the coming Lunar New Year's holiday on February 10th, which is also known as the Spring Festival. It's China's most important holiday, and the one which families try their hardest to spend together. This means each year, over a billion people have the same plan of using China's transport infrastructure to reunite with relatives. Adding to the strain is that each year, more and more migrant workers move from China's rural areas to the country's big cities. For these hundreds of millions, travel can be a monumental task during the season. Public transportation is expected to accommodate about 3.41 billion individual trips nationwide, including 225 million railway trips, 35.5 million by air, and 3.14 billion road tickets. The number of railway passengers will be up by 4.6 percent on last year. To cope with the increase in passengers, the railway department will add 450 more pairs of temporary passenger trains every day to meet the travel demand. Railway capacity has increased by 220,000 daily trips over the last year. However, the capacity is relatively limited considering the travel demand during the spring festival holidays. Therefore, it is hard to meet the demand for travel despite our efforts. It is plausibly described as the biggest movement of people in world history. So wherever you are on Chinese New Year, spare a thought for those taking part in this massive yearly pilgrimage home. Have you ever dozed off for a few seconds while sitting at an early morning traffic light? Thank goodness one motorcyclist rider in East China was not daydreaming as he waited for a light last week. Watch to see what happens next when an oncoming truck became unbalanced as it turned in front of him. A lucky escape for this Chinese motorcyclist who saw a heavy truck overturn before his very eyes and dismounted just in the nick of time. The incident, caught on a traffic camera, happened on January 22nd in the eastern province of Zhejiang. The truck's driver reportedly lost control while making a sharp turn at an intersection on a national highway. I was driving the truck downhill at about 10 kilometers per hour. The road gets very windy around here and the back compartment of the truck tilted towards the right side and then flipped over, so then the front of the truck had to follow. State media reported that no one was hurt in the accident. The quick-thinking motorcyclist was clearly paying attention to the truck. He got off just before the truck's container grinded his motorcycle across the street. Road safety is a big concern in China. In 2010, Chinese police officially recorded more than 200,000 road accidents that lead to deaths or injuries. The number of fatalities were over 65,000. And that's all for this broadcast of NTD China News. For more on China-related topics, visit our website at ntd.tv or subscribe to our YouTube channel, NTD on China. Coming up next is China Focus, and I speak with Jason Ma and Zhifei Chen about where the Japan and China disputed islands is headed.